Hi, my name is David Seow and I run SG Muso. We are a non-profit uh, society uh, registered as a charity uh, under the Charities Unit of MCCY. So today, uh, we'll be talking about what the current climate of, of COVID-19 and how as the music industry or rather how music export survives this current climate. Alright, so a little bit more about SG Muso. Um, uh, we we have always been about plugging the gaps within the industry and since we got charity status this year in 2020 we've been focusing we will be focusing more on charity initiatives going forward uh, but essentially our goal is just to uh, create a vibrant and viable ecosystem for for people within the music ecosystem all right this is the com uh, council which acts like the board of directors uh, and made it's made out of industry people uh, we have three pillars of which we we separate what we do into to various uh, uh, objectives and, and various strategies and we do have a membership base as well made, made up of mostly of course uh, people within the music industry um, and these are some of the programs and, and initiatives that we've done uh, that kind of highlight what the gaps are within Singapore's music ecosystem as well as uh, what we aim to achieve with some of them. So we've done some panels, uh, we've done uh, charity concerts, we've done music export programs like ASEAN Music Showcase Festival. We'll talk more about that later on. Uh, Skip Indie Starter Kit, just education stuff, uh, seminars and workshops. Uh, we've done uh, more export programs uh, and even uh, some live streams as well. Uh, and this dates back to pre COVID, yay. <laughs> Where we had a, where we were able to do more live events, uh, and curation basis kind of events. Um, but the focus is SG Muso, as like I said, has always been to plug gaps within the industry, and today what we really want to talk about is is uh, how how COVID has affected us, and that and how COVID has affected music export specifically, which means uh, that we we have to how we are adapting. How SG Muso is adapting, how the industry is adapting slightly, but with a focus on music export. So these are more highlights that we've done, some panels. Uh, this was quite recent in September, uh, partnered up with five countries to do music export, digital music export. Um, we've done some live stream uh, things with producers. Um, uh, oh, this one was this was fun. This was last year when 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 uh, we brought we did music export to to to. Taiwan, um, some consultation stuff as well, uh, festivals, charity events, uh, and another export program. Um, so let's move on to music export, uh, the how. So I'll, I'll go through how we, we have thought about uh, strategizing around music export, the, the tradition kind of traditional approach around music export. Uh, then we'll move on to uh, how we are thinking about it now. Um, I guess when, when thinking about music export, the concept being a slightly abstract and, and a bit less uh, straightforward. Um, some really good examples of music export have been uh, Korea, South Korea with the export of K-pop uh, and even like K-hip-hop from the 90s onwards. Um, and Australia, Australia has been massively successful in exporting their artists. So... Uh, to break it down really simply uh, for uh, f today, what music export, uh, what you would need for music export is, is a variety of things including these, these three things here. Uh, number one being goodwill where, where you have a strong relationship with the artists of your market. Because if you're going to export your own artists, uh, sing, rather your own country's artists, uh, you need the support of these artists and industry as well. So uh, you need to have good working relationship with them and goodwill with them. Um, number two would be a network, right? Because no man is an island. We, 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 we have to mobilize um, contacts, our own contacts, excuse me, so as to, to move around, move, create mobility for an artist. Uh, number three is understanding the other markets which we want to export to because uh, if you don't, if you don't know uh, how to localize strategies around music export, then becomes a, a bit more of a, a, 
a hit and miss situation, right? Uh, so the current models that we've kind of been inspired by and have taken bits and pieces from uh, include the successful ones, of course. Uh, with France, they have the Le Bureau Export, which is a... Uh, which is genius in terms of their funding sources, uh, the way they're thinking about it, which uh, you can see here, they take a portion of ticket sales, uh, this is uh, collect from, from CMOs as well, um, and even the Ministry of Current Affairs. So uh, compared to, for example, Sounds Australia, which their funding sources include uh, more traditional industry-facing kind of uh, organizations and government, government agencies, well, why why funding sources are important is because music export is typically a lose I call it a lose money lose money business where where the benefit doesn't go to the organization doing it. You know that means um, if uh, for Ash Muso when we export we don't typically we don't typically earn from it. Uh, there's no very well, revenue generating and revenue kind of uh, uh, capturing that that the monetary value is really hard. Whereas the benefit goes directly to the artists, it goes directly to industry, there's trickle-down effects as well when artists become really successful. Um, but, but essentially, uh, the organization, the music export office that does it is, is often uh, you know, stuck, right? So um, typically we see music export, office being, music export offices being government funded because there's a, there's a vested interest in exporting your own country's cultural capital, right? Where, where you think about exporting your own art, you say you're exporting Singapore artists, it makes Singapore look good, right? I mean, it brings tourism to the country if an artist is, is successful. It brings uh, economic value to the, 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 the country via employment, via and money back into Singapore. So uh, government support is absolutely necessary for music export. Um, that is until we see an interesting model pop up in the world, right? Uh, so if you see the, the activities of both countries, you can see the, the typical activities there. Uh, country showcases, uh, publishing camps, uh, panel discussions, exchange programs, networking, trade missions. These are a part of like a glo uh, uh, their, their global strategy in terms of how they want to activate and mobilize uh, music export. So um, for example, I see the French export uh, uh, showcases Quite often in 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 there's one in, in usually one in Zandari in, in South Korea that's usually top notch artists and the French and the Austrian Auss, Aussies are well known for create uh, for exporting and creating and developing great artists right so um uh, this is an interesting uh, second part of music export where we in order to justify the spending in order to 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 quantify it, there are well, rather there are quantifiable and non-quantifiable metrics. Right. Um, so the way that we've been thinking about it was was the traditional ones where you could, are able to quantify your employment, your booking fees, uh, things that you can put a dollar value to, uh, are very straightforward to count, right? Because if, let's say you get uh, an an artist gets uh, merchandise sales from the export program in Bangkok then you are able to count how much is being sold, literally. Um, <clears throat> and likewise, the other metrics are very quantifiable. So I've, I've, I've dropped down the, a table here of, of how uh, Australia's music export is being quantified uh, in in the, the, the things that are able to be quantified. And it, if you, it totals 0.06% of, of all Australian export, which is massive if you think about it. <coughs> of all goods and services, music export takes up 0.06%. So 194 uh, million, 195 million dollars, Aussie dollars there. So the quantifiable metrics are easy. Those are uh, well, relatively easy to, to measure and to, to write down and to quantify in order to justify the spending uh, to the government or to your funding partners. Whereas the other metrics... Um, is they are quite a, quite a bit harder, so the uh, so things like marketing value of new fans and cultural capital these are things that uh, are not typically quantifiable and don't have a dollar value to them, but um, 
there is a company called Sound Diplomacy that does uh that runs music cities. They do studies uh, around the development of a, a city into becoming a music city. So they do studies. I think they they did one in Berlin, was it? Uh or all over the world they're basically doing studies um to 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 show that this city has potential in becoming a hub for music uh by assigning a, a economic value to things that are typically not assignable to. So this is a bit of like econometrics, right? Where, yeah, you can put a marketing value of, uh, you can put a dollar value to the marketing value of new fans. New fans, if you want to get a new fan, usually you spend like, for example, you spend like $50 uh, in marketing to get a new fan. Whereas if you, done, if you did a showcase, you got like 100 fans for this artist. How much is that in in uh in actual dollar value? That's like five thousand dollars, right? Cultural capital is a bit harder, but uh, but there are ways. I would imagine there are ways to to quantify that kind of uh quantify that kind of effect and benefit to the country and to the artist. So together with this measure measurement metrics become really important because then you can justify your spending. Let's say you had spent <clears throat> Australia had spent fifty million dollars in export that year. But the export value is 195 million. That's uh, just the quantifiable is 195 million. That's a lot uh, of ROI. So if you can think about returns uh, in that, that sense, then it becomes very justifiable. Very justifiable. Um, so on our side, what we've been thinking about in, in, with pre-COVID <laughs> has been to categorize some of the opportunities uh, into, into these four categories um, where commercial and major festivals, uh, things like in, in Asia, uh, things like We The Fest, uh, festivals like We The Fest are typically large scale festivals, more for the mass market consumers uh, and listeners. Uh, so these are, as I wrote down, large scale high impact. So if you can get an artist into there by, by for example, uh, in Indonesia, for example, we have, uh, they, there's a really expensive performance visa cost um, so typically your low or mid tier acts will not be able to play in Indonesia because uh, it costs so much per person to bring in that to pay for the visa in order for them to perform. So um, organizations need to come in. To be, sometimes labels do it as well to 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 open the doors for them to be able to secure a slot in a consumer festival. Um, and if you if you if you manage to secure a slot every year. Uh, Maybe un, maybe uh, a written agreement with some of these festivals, then and where the music export officers pays for the for the performance visa or the travel costs, so that there's there's a win win on both sides. The the consumer festivals can offer the platform for the artists to showcase their music and gain new fans. The the music export office then has a has a high impact uh, export program that they can rely on every year. Number two, which is more, we, we see quite often uh, the showcase festivals and conferences, uh, South by Southwest being the most, uh, um, the largest one in the world, right? So in Asia, there are smaller, uh, I would say really great ones where where we get to network and make friends with with, in, with industry of, of the rest of Asia. Uh, in South Korea, there's Andari Festa, Bangkok, Bangkok Music City, Singapore, there's Music Matters. Um, there's... Uh, Indonesia, there's Archipelago, uh, a whole bunch of them. Taiwan, there's Lockfest. So, showcase festivals are more industry facing, uh, where uh, typically a country comes in and says, well, "I want to do a Singapore showcase." Yeah, let's uh, let's put together a night of just Singaporean acts and then cater food and beer. <laughs> so, uh, it is a very good environment to for for acts for talent buyers to come in and see uh, acts from a specific country and to get interested in those acts and offer opportunities. Of course, then there's the panel discussions during the day and the networking sessions which make which make everything smooth, I guess, like lubricating the relationships and making sure that we, we uh, everybody has, has the opportunity to network and get to know industry from, an, uh, from the other countries, right? Um, that often means that showcase festivals are... Uh, uh, a bit, their nature of being more industry specific. You don't don't earn as many fans or, or per se, but you win over the industry. Right, we win over the music, uh, professionals, the delegates from, from 
from whichever country they're from and then you secure the opportunities that way so uh, it's a very popular choice for music export offices um, and rightfully so uh, number three we have opening act exchanges these are these are some things that likewise in Asia the the issue uh, the prevailing issues is that each each country is a market of its own a segment of its own with very unique circumstances and, and language so uh, opening act exchanges might be great uh, because of primary uh, the photo there is uh, no room from Philippines with 1975 so he followed uh, 1975 all along uh, for tour I mean basically like his prod prodigy prod protege <laughs> sorry um, and making uh, and making a name for himself by riding on the the headliners act uh, headliners uh, pool crop pool right uh, and things like that I, they are a bit to me they're, they're, they're slightly lower cost and also high impact because it makes a lot of sense because like if if you pay an, uh, a budding artist with an established artist that are of the similar of similar genre that would mean that uh, the fans of the the established artists would would likely there's a chance that they would like the music of the of the budding artists so it's it's putting the right people in front of the right uh, act yeah and for to will be ad hoc opportunities that will be like ad hoc music exchanges direct with other offices uh, so music export often you have to think of it as a two-way street where yes you, you can export your country's uh, acts but at the same time importing other countries acts into your own market will create will create like a highway right because let's say i import uh, and as you music we've done that for quite a bit actually we imported uh, indonesian acts thai acts malaysian acts and then it makes it easier to 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 for Singaporean acts to go over as well, and it creates the relationship between the act and the acts that you bring in and acts that are being showcased as well, right? Uh, and brands as well. That could be one. Uh, okay. Uh, let's let's talk about about the current COVID nineteen situation. Yeah, I've summarized the the observations into four main categories here. Well, number one, where borders are closed. Um, when borders are closed, I mean the the obvious things are that your touring circuit is down, your headliners uh, don't travel anymore for promoters. They don't have, are unable to put up shows. Tourism takes a massive hit as well. Uh, I mean airline industry, uh, but the entertainment industry, the one that we exist in, uh, takes a massive hit. Um, your uh the local market number two, your own local market, your venues are are, are shut down. Um, and everyone's kind of forced to evolve into a digital world where where live streaming is the norm now, right? Where you have live stream events, um, and the appetite for shows is really high. For live shows, is really high. Number three, consumption patterns. What we've seen is that uh, the media consumption patterns change because uh, if everyone, if you think about it logically, if you are uh, you're stuck at home, you're more inclined to. To consume media that's a lot more uh, engaging, a lot more immersive. Um, for example, uh, if you wanted to take a one hour break from your work, would you hop onto Netflix or would you hop onto a DSP like Spotify, Apple, Deezer? Um, and we like more like more so than more so than more often than not, uh, we see the more immersive media taking precedence. So people <laughs> would rather watch shows and Netflix and and TV and more immersive media or play games uh, because they can simply because they can whereas if you were to take a one hour uh, like a break from your your office building uh, it's not like you can whip out whip out hef whip out headphones and just watch Netflix <laughs> in front of everybody else right so um, the consumption patterns have changed quite a bit and music has taken at least in Singapore and we've seen the uh, the numbers have shown that the the passive listening has gone down so if you think about it logically as well in if you are in your workplace uh, music often is a passive consumption uh, you put on headphones and you do your work and you just click a playlist and then you listen to it as you do at work right so or you put on speakers and then you play for the office so it was quite a uh, kind of passive consumption but music still being played right it's still being streamed so the numbers that went down slightly but 
but I mean that that kind of it really kind of related to to the streaming stuff as well where where music as a live stream live stream event needs to be exceptionally interesting to compete with uh with immersive media uh like your like Netflix watch a movie versus a questionable uh live stream event sometimes the quality of the live the production varies right so uh yeah, it's really hard for music to compete nowadays uh in number 4 uh, moving on to to what's happening with funding, we see uh, uh, in Singapore the freelancer funding has, and arts funding has been massive. So we've seen the government throw out uh, dig into the reserves to to fund uh, not just the arts, of course, but but uh, employment to fund uh, freelancers, just dishing out cash essentially. And with the arts, it's make it it was more uh, about uh, making them work for 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 the funding so i'll talk a bit more about that later but but uh, the ministries have been have been really supportive uh, and really really helpful in in opening doors and opening funding for for the struggling uh not for the struggling for everyone for everyone here so um of course some of these observations uh by their nature is is very it's or not all doom and gloom. I mean, if you think about what's happening now, there are uh, opportunities. I would say there are opportunities for for things to happen. So, um, what I would say is, uh, for example, the touring circuit closing down um, is also an opportunity because um, if you are an artist that is that that is touring regularly. Uh, now it costs a lot less to tour. The world is smaller, right? It's the digital world now where festivals are all going online. Showcase, even showcase festivals are going online, um, which means you could film from the comfort of your own country. You could change the production and the set to look however you like uh, and do it for much less a cost than flying your entire crew over to that country to play, right? So if you're being opportunistic about it, you could secure uh, slots in in both consumer festivals and showcase festivals where you where it costs a lot less to to tour <laughs> tour digitally uh, and the opportunities are there for you to take right likewise if you're a freelancer or or, or someone who typically relies on on funding uh, there are so many relief funds out there at least in singapore i'm not too sure about the, the region uh, but I imagine each government has has an interest to to make sure the arts uh, industries don't die off <laughs> uh, to so if you're f- or an arts organization or arts uh, arts group or freelancer there are opportunities for for you to 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 create digital presentations of your work uh, by taking funding and um, of course when when it creates this demand right if where where live events are, are no longer happening. Once once the borders and the live event entertainment industry comes back, it will come back with a with with vengeance. <laughs> so, uh, if an artist can 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 be prepared for for that eventual opening up, then and capitalize on it, monetize on it, that'll be great. Uh, there's one thing that we see one uh, from all these bad observations. I guess not not bad, but negative observations that. Uh, that we, one thing we we've, we've seen is that the number of collaborations and and publishing uh, uh, output of artists essentially have have increased dramatically. So, um, if you are an artist, who primary full time artist, the lock lockdowns have mean that you have so much time on your hands, right? And you're stuck at home, uh, and. Uh, if you're stuck at home, what do you do as an artist? You write music, right? You create content. Uh, the quality of content, the quality of, of of the output of the artists have increased so much during this period. We see so many releases every Friday, and uh, and we see collaborations happen a lot more because people are, are forced to collaborate uh, digitally now. There is that that uh, that growth in terms of of uh, setting up uh, setting up that infrastructure individual infrastructure to create songs and to and even for publishing sake you know writing for publishing that that has seems to have increased a bit as well so i wouldn't say it's all doom and gloom 
uh, for, for for artists there are there are those opportunities to 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 make something out of this period uh, yeah moving on uh, I have two things here that I like to talk about um, that are nice examples of how uh, Singapore has uh, or rather SU Muso has embraced this this current climate and maybe that would serve to inspire or 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 to kind of give I give ideas on what what can be done out there. So we've been very lucky in Singapore, uh, where our government, like I said, could dug into the reserves, and and brought out uh, a lot of funding for 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 the arts. So National Arts Council has released these grants called the Digital Presentation Grant, which are which are like fifteen thousand USD, up to fifteen thousand USD per 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 event. Uh, per project rather and these are open to anyone and and they've been dish- I think the current count is 300 more than 300 projects have been taken up uh, have been supported by NEC's uh, the National Arts Council's digital presentation grant and and to me that is a strong way of showing showing support to your industry the mindset is that uh, the fund with by funding these shows the industry, uh, each part of the industry gets a uh, direct, uh, funding, or rather direct payment. So if uh, if you do put up a digital festival, people are gonna get paid. Your crew is gonna get paid. Video crew is gonna get paid. The artists are gonna get paid. And that's one way to support the industry, a uh, strong way of supporting the industry, making the artists work and the industry work for for, the payment essentially. So, <clears throat> uh, I think, this appeared before, but. So I want to talk a bit more about this. Um, it was uh, at the Asan Music Showcase Festival. I know the name's really similar, but <laughs> but uh, um, this was an initiative set up by Fang Jai from Thailand, uh, and he called for they called for other countries Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, and Philippines to to uh, to put together in a digital showcase. Right, so we have we put together a. a a two-day festival essentially. There's more industry facing, but because of the nature of uh of dig- digital festivals, we could also bring in bring in uh, uh fans, I guess, to try and cross promote, right? When you have five different country five different countries now, <coughs> we could cross promote into each other's market and region. Uh and like I said before, uh f- filming filming uh, uh it was four four X per country. So filming four X per country is cheaper <laughs> than taking four X, flying them over, booking accommodation, and 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 bring buying back line, uh, and setting up a whole mini festival within the festival for them. So it's much doable. It was supported by by National Arts Council, uh, the grant that I mentioned before, uh, and I I think it was was successful. You know, like a. A lot of cross promotion, some of the acts and now know each other. Then there have been festival uh, offers uh, to some of them as well, and I I think this is the new model of showcase festivals. Uh, there's speed dating, online speed dating session sessions. Um, and I think yeah, this is a nice way of 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 still keeping the industry going, and still still making sure the artists get paid, making sure the 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 industry is involved. And prepping for the next way, the, the opening up of, of borders and opening up of events. The next one I wanted to talk about is this label showcase. So Sonic Philippines is a showcase in uh, in showcase festival slash conference uh, in Manila. Uh, and so this year they opened it up to to of course it's digital as well. It's, it was in October. So uh, Likewise, this Singaporean label took uh took the opportunity to uh that's me by the way yeah uh to to showcase some of their best acts so Singapore uh, some of Singapore this Singaporean label's best acts into uh this fest showcase festival <coughs> uh similarly supported by National Arts Council uh and we we see uh and they're showcased to uh. uh Industry delegates and Filipino audiences, uh, so, and you're still doing things, still keeping the artistry going. You're still keeping the artists going. Uh, <clears throat> interest in artists going. You're still making sure that the industry moves. I think that's been really important. 
I mean, the whole the whole name of the game now is adaptability. So you are if you are able to adapt, if you are able to to uh, to capitalize on the current uh, uh, I guess climate, then then you might survive, might just survive. So thank you so much for having me at AKMF. Uh, uh, my name is David. Once again, uh, if you want to reach out to us, uh, you can reach out to this email address. Um, and I wish you all a great day. Uh, stay safe. Wear a mask at all times, please. And I can't wait to see all of you when the borders open up.